Hi, Miss Nikki here. Welcome to Chapter 12, Part 1. We're going to talk about some of the adult brain regions and some of the associated structures, and then we're going to talk about their functions. So let's get started. Before we start talking about the different regions of the brain, we need to look at brain development, and I just wanted you to be familiar with these terms in case they came up again. So we see sequelization. Right here, this is the evolutionary development of the anterior portion of the central nervous system, and that the posterior end becomes the spinal cord. And maybe the next slide will help make this a little bit more clear. So in this figure, this is secondary brain vesicle development. This is at about five weeks. And the reason I'm doing this is because you might see these two terms. For some reason, we don't use the other ones very often, but you'll see diencephalon, and that is the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And then sometimes you'll see the word mesencephalon, and that specifically has to do with the midbrain. So basically, we're talking about dividing this five-week um, embryo into sections that are going to differentiate into all of these regions of the brain. Here's a list of the adult brain regions. We have the cerebral hemispheres. We're going to have a right and a left. Then we have the diencephalon region, which is composed of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. Then we have the brainstem, which is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And then last, we have the cerebellum. I like this figure because it color codes everything for you. You can see the cerebral hemisphere here. You might also see the word cerebrum. Then in purple here, you can see the diencephalon. Remember, that's the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And then everything in green here is the brainstem, which is made up of the midbrain, pons, and the medulla oblongata. Directly below the brainstem or inferior to the brainstem is your spinal cord. And this back section here, this is going to be the cerebellum. Before we move on, we need to talk about some of the organization of the central nervous system. So we have gray matter and white matter. Think of white matter as myelinated, gray matter as unmyelinated, and you can clearly see here these, this butterfly shape, which would be gray matter, and then everything outside would be white matter. You could also add another layer to this. White matter is myelinated. Myelinated means fast. Gray matter is non-myelinated. Myelinated means slow and steady. We just saw the organization of the spinal cord when we saw the white matter, and then we saw our gray matter on the inside, right? So gray matter was central cavity, white matter was external. Now in the brain, we're going to see nuclei and the cortex or a cortex, and these are all gray matter. Let's take a look at the next figure. Inside the brain, this is a cross section of the brain stem to be exact, and we can see these areas of gray matter, and there's many of them. So the, remember, the gray matter is going to be neuron cell bodies, and we call these nuclei. This figure shows both. So we've taken a frontal section of the cerebrum, and we're looking at the cortex, which is the gray matter on the outside. So this is the cortex. And then we have these sections of nuclei, clusters of gray matter inside or surrounded by white matter. So the organizational structure is a little bit different in the brain and the spinal cord. We're going to move on to discuss the ventricles of the brain. These are basically chambers, and these chambers are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. They're lined by ependymal cells. Do we remember those neuroglial cells that we talked about in Chapter 11? So these are going to help create cerebral spinal fluid. There are two lateral ventricles. There is a third ventricle in the diencephalon, and there's a fourth ventricle that's behind the pons, basically. I know we don't know where those structures are yet, but we will. Here are the two lateral ventricles. They used to call them first and second, but now they call them lateral ventricles. Then we have the third ventricle, which is this kind of widening here. And then we have the fourth ventricle, which is behind the pons. All of these are going to contain cerebral spinal fluid, and they're going to help wash the brain, basically. So here's a real brain. I just wanted to stress that you can see the ventricles here. The ventricles would have been filled with fluid, but once you remove the brain from the skull and you remove the layers that surround the brain that keep this fluid in, 
when the fluid is no longer there, you just see a cavity. But it, this would be lined with layers of cells that would be producing a cerebral spinal fluid that would be filled in these cavities. The first part of the brain that we're going to discuss in a little more detail are the cerebral hemispheres. Remember, you can also see the word cerebrum. This accounts for the majority of the brain mass. We're going to see several surface markings on the next slide, and I'll explain to you and show you an example of each of these. And then we're going to look at two very specific fissures. From the previous slide, let's look at all of these structures. Here we have a fissure. A fissure is a very deep sulcus. What's a sulcus? A sulcus is a shallow groove, right? What's a gyrus? A gyrus is a ridge. If you see gyri or sulci, these are just the plural forms of those two words. So a gyrus is one, a sulcus is one, a fissure is one. Longitudinal fissure is this line that divides the right and the left cerebral hemispheres. The transverse cerebral fissure is this line here that divides the cerebrum from the cerebellum. We further divide the brain into five lobes. Four of them are represented here, and they're pretty close to where the cranial bone location would be. So all of this is frontal, temporal is here, occipital here, Parietal is probably the only one that doesn't really match where the cranial bone was located. If you remember, the parietal came up a lot farther when we talked about our cranial bones. In order to see the lobe called insula, you need to retract the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. So you need to pull these apart, and it's this interior section. The reason this is important is we're going to come back and talk about taste a little bit later, and this is where your gustatory cortex is located, or the area where all of your taste buds send information to. So instead of reading all the words on the previous slide, I figure we'll just skip straight to the picture. We'll look at the central sulcus. It's this central groove in the cerebrum, and it divides into the precentral and postcentral areas. They say gyrus, they're talking about this ridge right here. But this area, the precentral, this is where motor information is going to leave the brain. And then the postcentral backside, this is where sensory information is going to enter the brain. We've also seen gray matter and white matter already. They just wanted to reiterate that this is cerebral cortex or cortex in general. They took it out of this section here. We'll talk more about cerebral cortex in just a second, and that this is white matter. So by now, we should be able to say gray matter is unmyelinated, and it's slow and steady information. White matter is myelinated, and this is fast information. So we need to focus on the cerebral cortex just for a second. So cortex is telling you that this is gray matter, and it's located in the uh, cerebrum, and it's the outer edge. This is basically the site of your conscious mind. This is what gives us awareness, sensory perception, so to feel things. This is where we initiate motor control, communication, memory storage, understanding. So basically your cerebral cortex, it defines who you are. Here's another great figure from your book showing you the cerebral cortex. So all of this gray matter that's on the very outer edge, this is all cerebral cortex. Then we have white matter, and then we have these nuclei. These are cell bodies of neurons, and they're unmyelinated, right? Unmyelinated gray matter. Sometimes we'll talk about lateralization of the cerebral hemispheres basically talking about the left hemisphere and right hemisphere. Most of us know this uh, left hemisphere is science and math skills. Right hemisphere might be art and you know music skills. I want to make clear that it's not that you are using one side more than the other. We're using both sides and we're going back and forth. It's just if you're doing a specific task. If you're calculating a math, math problem, then your left hemisphere is working more than your right. If you're engaging in some sort of artistic activity, then your right hemisphere is working more than your left hemisphere. There are three functional areas when we talk about the cerebral cortex. 
We have a motor area, we have a sensory area, and we have association areas. If you remember, we talked about sensory messages going to the brain. Then the brain has to decide what it wants to do. That's the association. And then the brain sends a message out, and that's motor control. And then just to drive the point home, make sure we understand that your conscious mind, conscious behavior involves the entire cortex and all of the lobes. So it's not one part working at one time. They're all working together. We need to talk about some of the motor areas of the cerebral cortex. So first we have the primary motor cortex. This is located in the precentral gyrus. This is next to the central sulcus. This allows conscious control, precise, skilled, voluntary movements. You initiate the movement. Two, we have the premotor cortex. This is repetitious or pattern behavior skills. And then three, we have Broca's area. Broca's area is the motor innervation that directs the muscles of the tongue and allows you to speak. It works in conjunction with an, a sensory area called Wernicke's. So Wernicke's directs the understanding of the written and spoken language. So let's look at the figure and we'll talk about these again. Here's the central sulcus I was talking about. And the central sulcus, remember, is the division line. Anything anterior is going to have something to do with motor control, and anything posterior is going to have something to do with sensory control. So here we have our primary motor cortex. It's located in the area very anterior to the central sulcus. And we said that this is voluntary, precise movement. We have the premotor cortex, which is this area here. This is for repetitious, uh, patterned kind of behavior. Then in this area, we have Broca's. Broca's area directs speech and tongue movement. I wanted to point out Wernicke's, even though this is a sensory area, because it works in conjunction with Broca's. So Wernicke's area is back here in the sensory area, and this allows you to understand. You use these two divisions together. So Broca's is forming speech, Wernicke's is understanding. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hi, my name is Effie, you're listening with your Wernicke's area, right? You're understanding, what did this person just say to me? Then you have to transfer that information to your Broca's area, where your Broca's area is gonna say, what do I wanna say and how do I want to respond to what this person just said? And then you formulate a pattern of speech and you initiate that motor voluntary um, movement. Th this is difficult because in some cases, if patients have strokes or this interneuron gets disrupted, the person understands what you're saying, but they cannot transmit the information to the Broca's area in order to form the words to respond to what you said. Another clinical topic that might be interesting is if you see a patient that has a stroke, if the damaged part of the brain was in the primary motor cortex, it can paralyze muscles. So the paralysis is usually on the opposite side of the body from where the damage occurred. So if the brain damage is on the right side, then it affects the left side of the body. You really just lose movement control and you can reprogram. So basically get the neurons, the damaged motor neurons to uh, synapse with the muscle. You can basically retrain yourself in some cases. So this is why some stroke patients, the damage was so severe, they're never going to be able to walk again or use that out of the body again. And in other stroke patients, if they do physical therapy, they may be able to regain some functional use in that side of the body. So now we need to look at some sensory areas of the cerebral cortex. One, we have the primary somatosensory cortex. It's gonna receive information from the skin, proprioceptors or proprioceptors, from your muscles, your joints, and your tendons. Remember um, telling your brain the constant state of all of your muscles, muscle tone. You might also see somatosensory association cortex. And then there's several more here. There's visual areas. So basically your optic nerve is gonna deliver information to a visual area of your brain for your brain to process. Auditory, olfactory, gustatory, this is taste. Olfactory is smell. Auditory is hearing. Hopefully we know visual is sight. And then vestibular has to do with uh, equilibrium.
So just to refresh, here's our central sulcus. Your central sulcus is that division line between everything here is going to be motor and everything here is going to be sensory. We already talked about the primary motor cortex. Now we need to talk about the primary somatosensory cortex. And it is this in purple. This gyrus in purple is where the primary somatosensory cortex is located. You can see the others. Here's the olfactory cortex about here. Primary visual cortex back here in the occipital lobe. We can't see the insula. Remember, we'd have to pull back the frontal and the temporal. But we have the gustatory cortex for taste internal at the insula lobe. And then we have our primary auditory cortex about here. And then again, here's the visual cortex back here. Here's wankies. So these are all sensory association areas. This figure is called a homunculus. And what they're trying to do is create a body map for both the motor and the sensory areas and how they relate specifically to the cortex, cerebral cortex. So what they're trying to get at is this entire section of the cerebral cortex is dedicated to causing motor action to occur somewhere in the face. We need to talk about cerebral white matter right now. We were talking about gray matter before, so everything previous to this was gray matter. Now we need to talk about white matter. So these, you should know, are myelinated neurons, and usually the myelinated part happens at the axon, which is why they keep calling these fibers. So there's three different types of fibers, and let's look at them in the figure. If we follow the color coding here, you can see the commissural fibers, and they're here. They connect right to left. So the right and left um, cerebral hemispheres can talk to each other. Then we see the association fibers. This is same side, and we can see that different parts of the cerebral cortex can talk to each other. And then we have projection fibers. They help connect the cerebral cortex out here to the mid and lower sections of the brain. Before we move into identifying each brain section, I wanted to do just an overall look. So here's the cerebral hemisphere, all of this, which we also call the cerebrum. We're going to talk about this purple section. And we're going to talk about the egg-shaped object, which is the thalamus, the epithalamus, which has a gland off of it called the pineal. Then we have the hypothalamus here, which is kind of a W-shaped. And off of the hypothalamus is the pituitary. Back here, we have the cerebellum. Then we have all of the green, which is the brainstem. They don't have it listed. The brain stem is made up of the pons, the medulla, and the midbrain. So this is midbrain, this is pons, and this is medulla oblongata. So first we're going to talk about the diencephalon. We're going to talk about the three parts, the thalamus, the hypo, and the epithalamus. So this section right here is the thalamus. Then off of the thalamus we have the hypothalamus. And then this back section is the epithalamus. Now you should think of epi as a pawn and hypo as below, but remember when this was developing, the epi was on top, then we had the thalamus, then we had the hypothalamus, but then we had this curve or this folding over of the brain. So now we have hypo, thalamus, and epi. Here's a figure of the thalamus you can see here. There are many different sections, so several nuclei named for their location. What I want you to focus on is that the function of the thalamus is to act as a relay station for information to and from the cerebral cortex. So it's gonna sort, edit, and relay information. Hypothalamus is a little bit more complex. We can see that it hangs below the thalamus. There's a stalk called the infundibulum that connects the pituitary to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is responsible for autonomic control of many of your visceral organs. So we're talking about blood pressure, we're talking about heartbeat, we're talking about your digestive tract, pupil size. It's also the center for emotional response, so pleasure, fear, rage, your biological rhythms, sex drives. Here's the figure of the hypothalamus. You can see many nuclei here. 
So these are all the nuclei in the W, which is the hypothalamus. Here's the infundibulum, here's the stalk, and then off of the stalk is the pituitary gland. And this will become important when you talk about endocrine and hormones. So here's another slide on hypothalamic function. So what does the hypothalamus do for us? Not only is it the autonomic control center for visceral organs, it's also going to regulate your body temperature. So in terms of sweating or shivering, it's going to have to do with food intake, water balance, and thirst. Your hypothalamus, if you're dehydrated, it's going to make you thirsty and therefore causing you to drink water. It regulates your sleep cycle. It controls your endocrine system. So we're going to see in 202 how these hormones play critical roles in all other organ systems within the body. So we'll talk about anterior pituitary. This releases growth hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, thyroid has to do with metabolism. Um, it's also going to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone that have something to do with your reproductive system. And then we have posterior pituitary hormones as well. So it gets a lot more complicated. You need to know the hypothalamus is highly critical, has lots of functionality, both the viscera and all of these other functions. Your epithalamus is the dorsal portion of the diencephalon. Part of the epithalamus is made up of this pineal gland, which secretes a hormone called melatonin. This helps regulate your sleep and awake cycles. So as your melatonin level increases, this makes you sleepy. So you might hear of people who take supplemental melatonin if they're having trouble sleeping. Just to recap, we have the cerebrum here, this W-shaped object or structure is the hypothalamus, off of it is the pituitary gland. We have the egg-shaped structure in the middle, this is the thalamus, it's going to relay information to the cerebrum. And then this back section we have the epithalamus and off of part of the epithalamus or off of epithalamus is the pineal gland. We're now going to move into this area here in green, which is the brain stem. On to the brain stem. When we say similar structure to the spinal cord with embedded nuclei, we should have an image in our head where we're going to have some gray matter core. We're going to have some white matter on the outside, and then we're going to have these little embedded pockets or nuclei of gray matter. The brain stem overall, all three parts of it control the autonomic or automatic behaviors necessary for survival. So right away you should be thinking heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, blood pressure. And we're also going to see that 10 of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves are associated with the brain stem. So here's a real brain so that we can see the midbrain would be back here. Then we have the pons here, then we have the modula oblongata here, and then we're going to have the spinal cord below. And you can see all of these nerves coming out of various sections of the brainstem. Those are cranial nerves. There are many different structures within the midbrain. Um, we know the least about the midbrain because it's buried so deeply or central to the overall brain structure. Uh, again, sometimes called the mesencephalon. I chose to focus on the motor structures. So we're going to see substantia nigra and basal nuclei both have something to do with movement, specifically muscle movement, inappropriate responses, and the inhibition of unnecessary movements. These are both areas that are affected in someone who has Parkinson's disease. Hence, they cannot control their muscle movement and they have unnecessary or inappropriate body movements, shaking. There are also some sensory structures within the midbrain and one of them has to do with eye movement and the other has to do with um, kind of relaying some of the hearing um, information in the brain. So these back little sections right here maybe in lab we'll talk about the corpora quad regimina and that would be this back little section right here. And so this is the midbrain from here to here. The next section we're going to talk about is the pons. The next section we'll talk about is the pons. Now this is located between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata.
and the fibers of the pons are going to help connect the higher brain centers to the spinal cord. They're also going to relay impulses between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. Remember, the cerebellum is that structure that's most posterior to the pons. We haven't talked about the particular formation yet. We're going to come back and talk about this, but they believe that the pond also helps maintain our normal rhythm of breathing. Here's a nice figure from your book showing you the pons and showing you all of the additional gray matter nuclei within the pons. I want to go back and show you in this figure the two statements that talked about the function of the pons. So remember the pons is here, and we said the pons helps coordinate information between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. So this structure right here, that's the cerebellum, right? So if I want to send information from the cerebellum, I have to go to the pons first, and then that information can go to the cerebrum. So it's kind of a relay point for information between the cerebellum and the cerebrum. And then again, it talked about the pons being kind of the relay point between the spinal cord and the cerebrum. So if I'm going to send a motor message out, it has to go through the pons. If I'm going to send a sensory message in, it has to go through the pons. So basically, you can think of the pons as serving as a relay station for both the cerebrum and the cerebellum, and then from the cerebellum to the rest of the body. The most inferior or last section of the brainstem before the spinal cord is called the medulla oblongata. Sometimes people will just shorten it to medulla, but really medulla just means middle, so be careful. It blends into the spinal cord at the foramen magnum. Remember, this was the large hole that's in the occipital bone. So your brain stem turns into your spinal cord at the foramen magnum. Your medulla is an autonomic reflex center. So there's many functions that overlap with the hypothalamus. There's a cardiovascular center, which is going to adjust your heart rate. Um, you also have a vasomotor center, which is going to adjust your blood vessels for blood pressure. Then we have the respiratory centers that can generate your respiratory rhythm, that can control the rate and the depth of breathing. And then we have additional centers that are going to regulate some of these autonomic uh, reflex behaviors. So vomiting, if you eat something that could make you sick or has high bacteria, you're going to want to vomit or key material out of your stomach. Um, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, if you have something uh, stuck in your throat, you want to be able to cough it up and out. Uh, sneezing, you get some particles in your nose and you want to be able to sneeze them out. I like this figure of the medulla. I wanted to show you all of the many nuclei. So you can see a lot of these gray matter areas within the medulla oblongata, each one of them is going to have a specific job or function. And then here, you, anything that has a number, this is a cranial nerve. So we can see how many of the cranial nerves actually extend from the brainstem. Now we get to move on to the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is dorsal to the pons of the medulla. It is involved in providing precise timing and appropriate patterns of skeletal muscle contraction. What the heck does that mean, right? Think of hitting a baseball. What do you have to do in order to hit a baseball? As the ball's coming towards you, you have to precisely time when the ball will get to the area, and then how hard do you have to swing the bat, and what muscle movements do you need in order to swing the bat to make sure that the ball and the bat hit each other at the right time or the same time in order to knock the ball out of the park, right? So you're understanding precise timing, you're coordinating appropriate um, muscle contraction or muscle movement patterns to carry out a specific task. Before we move on to the next slide, I want to make sure that we understand how the cerebrum and the cerebellum can talk to each other. So this structure here is the cerebellum. They're specifically saying cerebral cortex or the outer section. This is the pons. So we said pons can relay information back and forth from the cerebellum. And the cerebellum, if it wanted to send information, it would go to the pons and then it could go up to the cerebrum. Same thing, the cerebrum can send information from the pons down to the cerebellum. So in order for you to have those precise timed movements, the cerebrum, remember, initiates motor command. The cerebellum is going to do the timing. 
So we have to have a way to coordinate information from those two areas of the brain. Now we need to look at how the cerebellum and the cerebral cortex talk to each other. Again, how do we take the precise timing of our movement and coordinate it with motor control? So the cerebellum is going to receive impulses from the cerebral cortex with an intent to have some sort of voluntary muscle contraction. So remember the cerebral cortex has a motor area and those motor areas initiate voluntary muscle contraction. Also remember that the cerebellum is always receiving information about the body's position. So it's always informing and it does this by something called proprioceptors. So they're gathering all the information about your joints, about your muscle movement. In the cerebellum, we have something called the cerebellar cortex. It's going to calculate the best way to smoothly coordinate muscle contraction, and then it's going to send that blueprint or that plan back to the cerebral motor cortex, and that's going to cause the action to occur. So here we have the cerebral hemisphere. Anything forward of the central sulcus is going to have something to do with motor control, right? So your cerebrum is going to send a message to your cerebellum and say, I would like to initiate motor action. The cerebellum is going to be receiving information from your proprioceptors. Remember, that's your muscle tone, your tendons, your joints, the state of your muscles. And your cerebellum is going to come up with a plan. And it's going to say this is the best way to coordinate all of your other muscles in order to get the action or desired response. So then that information is sent back through the pons, up through the thalamus, to the motor area. And then another neuron is going to send the information down to the spinal cord and out to the different muscles to initiate this uh, synchronized or timed muscle action event. So the limbic system is comprised of a number of structures that are all linked together by fibers or tracts or neurons to act as one whole system. Kind of like your heart and your blood vessels are linked together to give you your cardiovascular system. So the limbic system is called your emotional or your affective, which is the same thing as your feeling brain. You might also hear this called your primitive brain. So this has these two structures here. There's the amygdala. There's also lots of diarrhea. I just listed one, but there are many. Um, you can read these and see something to do with anger, with fear, assessing danger, fear responses, expressing emotions, resolving conflict. There's also olfactory bulb that's in association with these other structures linked together and in part of the limbic system, and it helps us put emotional responses to odors. So I gave you two examples here, chicken soup and it makes you think of grandma, or a certain perfume makes you think of a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Um, skunk smell tells you, hey, that's bad, I wanna stay away from that. You can see in this figure, here's the olfactory bulb, Here's the amygdala that we talked about here. There's also this structure called the hippocampus, which is here. You can see all of the gyri. And you can see that all of these structures form a system, or if you want to think of it as a network. And we call that network the limbic system. I have an interesting article about the hippocampus. If you want to read, they believe that this also has something to do with memory. So there's an interesting article in the articles folder if you'd like to read it. I want to make sure we understand that this limbic system doesn't operate independently. Most of the information is relayed via the hypothalamus. So remember your hypothalamus controls autonomic function, right? So this would be heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. So because this emotional brain has to go through the hypothalamus, which also controls autonomic function, sometimes we get these psychosomatic illnesses where emotion is causing an increase in heart rate or an increase in blood pressure. The limbic system also interacts with the prefrontal lobes. So we can react emotionally to things.
and that we understand the emotional richness in our lives. So the reticular formation is basically a collection of neurons. They extend through the central core of the brainstem, and there's this particular area called the RAS, and this takes sensory information and sends impulses to the cerebral cortex to keep it alert, or you can think, awake. It filters out repetitive and weak stimulus. If you have a pen in your hand and you're just holding it, maybe you don't remember you have the pen in your hand until you drop it. And then when you drop it, you went, oh, I need to pick that up. Your book also gives a great example about your watch. You want to read about that. So severe injury results in permanent unconsciousness. If you damage your reticular formation and this particular area called the RAS, you could be in a coma, which is unconsciousness for an extended period of time. There is a motor side to the reticular formation. It's going to help with some limb movement, and it's going to regulate some of the autonomic centers. So we're talking about vasomotor, which has to do with blood pressure, cardiac, which has to do with heart rate, and respiratory centers, which has to do with respiratory rate. You can see the neurons that make up the reticular formation in purple, and you can see they're radiating out to the cerebral cortex and that we have sensory information coming in. You can also see here that we have some descending motor neurons coming out of the spinal cord going to, like we said, coarse limb movement or visceral body action. This uh, reticular formation is inhibited when sleeping. And this is uh, thought to be carried out by the hypothalamus. So it initiates um, inhibition of the reticular formation. So this concludes chapter 12, part one. Now you have to go watch chapter 12, part two. Enjoy.